This is one of the largest, most difficult airlifts in history. And the only country in the world capable of projecting this much power on the far side of the world with this degree of precision is the United States of America. With this degree of precision. We're also keeping a close watch on any potential terrorist threat at or around the airport, including from the ISIS affiliates in Afghanistan who were released from prison when the prisons were emptied. And we're working on a variety uh, to verify that number. The Americans are still in country as we work on this because we're not, don't have the exact number of people who are uh, Americans are there. And those who may have come home to the United States, we're not, we want to get a, a strong number as to exactly how many people are there, how many American citizens, and where they are. We're going to retain a laser focus on our counterterrorism mission, working in close coordination with our allies and our partners. And as we continue to work the logistics of evacuation, we're in constant contact with the Taliban, working to ensure civilians have safe passage to the airport. I talk to our commanders on the ground there every single day, as I just did a few hours, an hour or so ago. And I made it clear to them that we'll get them whatever they need to do the job. How about Sleepy Joe? How about his performance? <laughs> Joe, what the hell is wrong with you, Joe? Sleepy Joe. He's Sleepy Joe. He was sleepy a long time ago, but now he's really sleepy. But let me be clear, any American who wants to come home, we will get you home. But make no mistake, this evacuation mission is dangerous. And then at number two, what is your message to the America's partners around the world who have criticized not the withdrawal, but the conduct of that withdrawal and made, it, made them question America's credibility on the world stage? I have seen no question of our credibility from our allies around the world. Imagine, just imagine, if that attack if bin Laden had decided with al-Qaeda to launch an attack from Yemen, would we ever have gone to Afghanistan? Would there ever be any reason we'd be in Afghanistan? The estimates of the cost of this war over the last 20 years range from a minimum of $1 trillion to a think tank at one of the universities saying $2 trillion. There's a greater danger from ISIS and, 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 and al-Qaeda and all these affiliates in other countries by far than there is from Afghanistan. So this is, this is where we should be. This is about America leading the world. And all our allies have agreed with that. Yes, we're making the same commitment. There's no one more important than bringing American citizens out. I acknowledge that. But they're equally important almost as all those who, those SIVs we call them, who in fact helped us. They were translators. They went into battle with us. They were part of the operation. And I am going to be working with our allies to see to it that we can bring international pressure on the Taliban to be, they're looking to gain some legitimacy. They're going to have to figure out how they're going to maintain that country. And there's going to be harsh conditions. We're strong conditions we're going to apply and it will depend on whether they get help based on whether or not how and well they treat women and girls, how they treat their citizens. So this is just beginning on that score. You just said that you would keep a laser focus on counterterrorism efforts and that you don't see as great of a threat of terrorism from Afghanistan uh, as other parts of the world. But if you and your administration so badly misassessed how quickly the Taliban would sweep through Afghanistan and we no longer have an embassy there from which to run intelligence operations, how can you at all be confident of your assessment of the risk of terrorism and the ability of the U.S. to conduct over-the-horizon missions to keep it in check. Can you tell Americans that they're safe and will remain safe from terror attacks in Afghanistan? I think you're comparing apples and oranges. Sir, just on that initial assessment, we, we learned uh, over the last 24 hours that there was a dissent cable from the State Department. Sure. Uh, saying that the Taliban would come faster uh, through Afghanistan. Can you say why, after that cable was issued, the U.S. didn't do more to get Americans got out? all kinds of cables, all kinds of advice. If you notice, it ranged from this group saying that they didn't say it would fall when it would fall, when it did fall, but saying that it would fall to others saying it wouldn't happen for a long time and they'd be able to sustain themselves through the end of the year. 
Thank you, Mr. President. Two questions for you. The military has secured the airport, as you mentioned, but will you sign off on sending U.S. troops into Kabul to evacuate Americans who haven't been able to get to the airport safely? We have no indication that they haven't been able to get in Kabul through the airport. We've made an agreement with the, with the Taliban thus far. They've allowed them to go through. It's in their interest for them to go through. So we know of no circumstance where American citizens are carrying an American passport or trying to get through to the airport. But we will do whatever needs to be done to see to it they get to the airport. You mentioned just now using every resource available for evacuations. Why haven't you ordered the military to expand the security perimeter around the Kabul airport? Do you have any plans to do so, given that will likely require more U.S. troops? And are you considering rescue operations to recover Americans and Afghan allies stuck behind Taliban checkpoints? The last the answer is yes to the last question. We're considering every, op every opportunity and every means by which we could get folks to the airport. That's number one. Number two, the reason why we have not gone out and started and set up a perimeter way outside the airport in Kabul is that it's likely to draw an awful lot of uh, unintended consequences. We've been in constant contact with the Taliban leadership on the ground in, in Kabul, as well as the Taliban leadership at Daho and we've been coordinating what we we're doing. That's why we were able, for example, how we got all of our embassy personnel out, how we got everyone out of the embassy safely. If we had decided 15 years ago to leave Afghanistan, it would have been really difficult. If we decided five years ago, if we, start, if we continued the war for another decade and tried to leave, there's no way in which You'd be able to leave Afghanistan without there being some of what you're seeing now. But what we've done so far is we've been able to get a large number of Americans out, all our personnel at the embassy out, and so on. And thank God, so far, knock on wood, we're in a different position. Thank you, Mr. President. I just want to follow up on something you said a moment ago. You said that there's no, no circumstances where American citizens cannot get to the airport. <laughs> that doesn't really square with the images we're seeing around the airport with the reporting on the ground from our colleagues who are describing chaos and violence. Are you saying unequivocally that any American who wants to get to the airport is getting there and getting past the security barrier and to the planes where they uh, want to go? I thought the question was, how can they get through to the airport outside the airport? And the answer is, to the best of our knowledge, the Taliban checkpoints, they are letting through people showing American passports. Now, that's a different question when they get in the rush and crowd of all the folks just outside the wall near the airport. That's why we had to, I guess, yet was it yesterday, the day before, we went over the wall and brought in how many? 169, 169 Americans. So it is a process to try to figure out how we, how we um, deal with the mad rush of non-Americans, those who didn't help, those who are not on the priority list, just any Afghan, any Afghan to be able to get out of the country. And so my guess is that no matter what, under what circumstances we, anyone there's not a whole lot of Afghanis. Uh, uh, there's a whole lot of Afghanis that just as soon come to America, whether there are any involvement with the United States in the past at all, rather than stay under Taliban rule or any, any, any rule. So what I was saying is that we have an agreement that they will let pass through the checkpoints that they, the Taliban, control. But Americans through. But, but given this, given the negotiations with the Taliban, the scenes that we're seeing, can you just fully explain why uh, the, the plan wasn't to go ahead with these evacuations of both Americans and allies before the drawdowns began, before Bagram was closed, looking back several months? Because whether it was now or several months from now, there seems to be a broad consensus that the Taliban would make these gains and these would be needed at some point. Well, yeah, at, at, at some point. But the point was that although we were in contact with the Taliban and Doha for this whole period of time, that at some point wasn't expected to be 
the total demise of the Afghan national force, which was 300 persons. Let's assume the Afghan national force had continued to fight and, ha and they were surrounding Kabul. They were not going to collapse. The Afghan forces, they were not going to leave. They were not going to just abandon and then put down their arms and take off. So that's what happened. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Weeks before the Taliban seized power in Afghanistan, China made a very public display of growing closer to the group's leadership. Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi meeting a Taliban delegation in northern China in July, giving legitimacy and perhaps confidence to the militant group long regarded with fear and suspicion by the rest of the world.